Cool. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to the Answer the Public Search, Listening and Buzzsumo webinar. Um, we're just going to give um, about 30 seconds or so for people to join. Um, let me just check that. Yes, I can see there's lots of you joining. So thank you so much for being here today. It's great to have, have you all here. Um, yeah, just let me know where you're at and we'll give a few of you shout outs. Please use the Q&A function today as well if you've got any questions. Hello to Sophie and Eric. I know you guys are going to be introducing yourselves in a minute, but yeah, it's great to have you both here. Sophie's joining us from Brighton today and Eric's in Boston and I'm in Lewis, which is on the south in England. Ah, we've got lots of people saying hello to us. So we've got people in Colombia, Canada, South Africa, Glasgow, love it. <laughs> Washington DC, Brooklyn, brilliant. Sweden, Scotland, more Scotland, hi guys, Italy, Reading in the UK, Bristol. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, loads of you in. Okay, cool. So I think we can get started. Great, so hi everyone, I'm Hannah from Answer the Public. Um, yeah, as I said, great to have you all here at today's session. A quick reminder of what our webinar series is all about. So every month we're talking to professionals from all different types of industries, from SEO and PR to paid search and content about how you can use search data to read people's minds and make better business decisions. So um, we're going to be showing you lots of different tools. Obviously, we've got the guys here from um, Eric here from BuzzSumo and Sophie from Search Listening today. We will be sort of dipping into Answer the Public to show you ways that you can use that to get more from your search data. Um, but just to let you know, this isn't an Answer the Public tutorial. Uh, there is one over on our YouTube channel if, if that's what you're looking for. So that's youtube.com um, forward slash C forward slash um, answer the public and there's a tutorial there. Um, we'll also, yeah, as I said, be giving you some examples. Um, for people that have been on our webinar series in the past, uh, there may be a few examples that, that are kind of familiar to you, um, but there's obviously a lot of new people here today, so it's, it's great to kind of educate those guys as well on all of the techniques that we'll be showing. So, Yes, the, today I'm speaking to Eric Delima Rubb. So Eric's from Brandwatch and BuzzSumo. And we're also with our regular guest, that's Sophie Coley from Search Listening. So hi guys. Um, today's session is going to all be about how observing online behaviour can help you produce better content. So we'll go on to the session in a second, but it'd be great if you guys could um, intro yourselves to everyone first. So Eric, did you want to... Say hello first. Of course. Thanks for the intro. Hi, everybody. Uh, as Hannah said, my name is Eric DeLima Rub. I am a customer success director um, at Brainwatch and um, have been the head of customer success for BuzzSumo for the past uh, however many years, I won't say out loud. Uh, so I, I, what's some fun facts about me? Um, I am working today in what we call the office nursery in my home, which is one part office, one part nursery. So if, you, if you're trying to make out the wallpaper in the background, yes, those are pictures of uh, giraffes and clowns. Um, that would be a fun place to run a webinar today. Uh, something else fun about me, I, I chose to move house in the middle of a, of a pandemic, uh, which was an exciting experience. If any of you are thinking about doing it, uh, I both recommend and don't recommend it. Um, <laughs> but uh, I'm really excited to be here with you today and answer as many questions as I can and um, share some of my experiences. Awesome. Thanks so much, Eric. It's great to have you here. And hello, Sophie. I know Hi. a few people will know Sophie's face from our previous webinars, but um, for everyone new, do you want to give a little intro as well? Absolutely. Um, I'm just going to also start by saying that I am down in Brighton on the south coast of England today and we are in the midst of a heat wave and I am sweltering hot and I've got a giant window here open so you may hear some seagull squawks as we go. I can only apologise but I'll melt if I don't have the window open. Um, but yes, thank you for, for joining the webinar and if you've not uh, met, seen me speak before, um, I'm Sophie Coley. I, uh, I have a couple of 
hats, I suppose. Um, so I am audience strategy director at a digital marketing agency called Propellernet. I've been in digital marketing for over 10 years now. Um, and throughout that time, I guess, spanning PR, creative, planning. Planning is kind of where I found my home. And I think um, I, I originally trained as a journalist. So I've always had a, a nosiness, I like to say, or curiosity, you might say, um, about people and how they behave. So um, I guess over the 10 years that I've been working in digital, I've built up this uh, e even more curiosity and, and come to see search data and online behavior more broadly as um, real telling giveaways into to people and their attitudes their motivations their behaviors whatever it is um, I think we can learn a lot about people from from observing how they behave online and uh, I've used Buzz, Buzzsumo um, which uh, Eric is obviously here representing today previously as well as um, Brownwatch which is a really great social listening tool um, and so when I talk about search listening it's very much um, I guess if you are familiar with social listening, I, so, so the idea of monitoring and tracking social conversations and, and, and taking learnings about audiences and brands from that, I, I believe that search data can help people to do exactly that. Um, it's a bit of a frustration of mine that search, search data tends to live in the SEO box within businesses and, and doesn't get accessed by people um, elsewhere in an organisation. So, so when I say I'm here from search listening, that's kind of my mission at the moment. And I've been doing that for, for the last year, trying to help marketers, business people, brands, agencies, whatever, to, to I guess, get more from search data. And hopefully I'll um, give you some examples of how you can do that with a, with a content hat on today. Lovely, that's perfect. Thanks so much, Sophie. Um, I can already see that there's quite a few people asking if the recording of this webinar um, is going to be shared afterwards. Um, I'm sure lots of you are wanting to watch it back, but yeah, it will be. It will be on our YouTube channel. So just to remind you what that is, it's youtube.com forward slash C forward slash answer the public. Because you've all registered, um, you will get a follow up, which will have all the notes from today's session and a link to the recording as well. One thing just quickly before we um, head on, can, if you've got any questions, can you please drop them into the Q&A rather than into the chat, just because we can then um, respond to them easier in that way. Cool. So, um, yeah, we'll be taking questions at the end of the session. There's half an hour for that. Um, if you've got anything that you, you want to share or you want to comment on the session, we'd love you to do that. These are all of our Twitter handles. So um, Eric is at BuzzSumo and Sophie is at Search Listening and I'm at Answer the Public. So yeah, please do share, we'd love to, to see your comments. Cool. Okay, so can you just, cool, yeah, lovely. Great, um, so yeah, first question then to you guys. So um, I guess this one is for Eric uh, to start off with. So what do you think, what are the kind of challenges that are facing um, content marketers today? Oh boy, how how much time do we have? Um, that's 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 really the, the million dollar question, right? Um, so I think I think for all of the individual challenges that come on a daily basis in terms of let's say our collective uh, head down work, um, there's a lot of different tasks we have to accomplish. But but we generally tend to find these come in um, three big buckets. I mean, the first is obviously volume. Um, as more and more brands and companies and agencies and, and sole proprietors are jumping in to the content game, we're, we're just faced with a really saturated landscape. And almost across all industries, it's getting more and more difficult to find ways to make your content stand out uh, because there is so many different options uh, for essentially answering similar questions. Um, so the volume game is really high. And just to give you kind of a couple of quick stats on that, I mean, uh, on WordPress alone, it's estimated that there's about 70 million new blogs posted every month. And that's just WordPress. That's not counting any other hosted site uh, that's not on WordPress. So that's the first thing is the volume game. How do we break through and be the signal in that noise? The, the second one I would say is really a sourcing issue. Traditionally, we used to think of content as having a single home, you know, like a blog or like our Facebook page, or maybe if you're old like me, your MySpace page back way back in the day. Uh, but now, um, the way that we define content uh, and the way that we search and, and interact with content is is really uh, it's really evolved over time. Um, 
So content can be produced on uh, social directly on our channels. We can uh, become content creators on YouTube. We can host our own medium page. Um, we might even think of, of interactive places like Reddit or Quora as content sources where we can either post or, or interact with content um, that we're looking for, uh, looking for answers to some of our questions. Um, so sourcing is a big thing, creating content for all of those different sources. I think the third one is, is, is really the one, it's the elephant in the room, I guess, that we always deal with is how do we measure it? It all comes back to ROI. We all know how hard it is to you know, approach, um, approach a, a campaign or, or a budgeting discussion and try to lay out how are we gonna measure whether it was successful or not. I, I think we're gonna talk about this a little bit later, you know, some ways we can measure it, but ROI is always the big challenge, um, especially if you are trying to plan out a content strategy in advance, how do you get buy-in up front by referencing how you think um, you're gonna measure its performance once it's concluded. So that, that, those are kind of the three big things that I normally come back to. Okay, that's awesome, thank you. And then um, Sophie, I guess the next question that really follows on from that is what can be done from kind of a search listening perspective to help navigate the challenges? I think you're on mute still. Sorry, just bear with us one sec. Is that better? Yeah, that's it, you're back. Thank you. Yeah, my, my unmute button has disappeared. So maybe maybe Zoom wants me muted. Um, what can be done to help navigate these challenges? So so the thing for me, I guess, that really stands out, uh, I, I would absolutely agree with with the three points that Eric has raised. And volume for me is, is an absolute killer. And I think, you know, the pressure to be creating good regular content that as Eric said, demonstrates ROI is, is like, that's huge pressure for any content creator today, right? You need to be creating good content. You need to be creating lots of it. Um, so the first thing for me really comes back to, to planning. And, and again, Eric alluded to it, but making sure that you are not just focusing on producing and you do carve out that time to plan. And I do appreciate that, um, given that there are those challenges around ROI, it can be really difficult to, to justify sometimes, I guess, taking that pause um, and making sure that you take time to upfront um, plan. But, but for me, that's where it really comes, comes down to where you're going to find the gold, I suppose, because if, if you're not, you're just going to be creating the same content that everyone else is creating um, and, and your ROI is going to be impacted and you're not going to get that engagement that you're looking for. Um, and when I talk about planning, um, for me, I, I think about people is a person here uh, in, in a few different ways. And I think actually um, my experience of creating content and again, coming from a digital marketing agency is that sometimes, sometimes there's like audience insight that's really easy to get and really obvious that you can find. And, and for me, it kind of falls in this top left um, bubble up here. So what is it that our audience wants and needs? So um, what do they want to buy? What services do they want? What information do they want? I think traditional keyword research really i mean it does a great job of uncovering those things right actually someone wants to buy some um new tennis shoes so they search tennis shoes they might tell you what size they want whatever it is but you know then that that's what they want and then you think okay i can create cre create content around that um and that's great and and um hopefully some of you who are uh, on the webinar today will be using answer the public to help diversify some of that a little bit more so you might be putting tennis shoes into answer the public and seeing what other topics you can touch on i think my, my point here really is that um there are, I think, uh, I got the numbers earlier, there's, there's like, I think almost 500,000 people a month using Answer the Public, and you can bet that some of those people will be typing in the same things that you are. And so if you're just um, doing keyword research using Answer the Public tools like that, and, and I guess not going beyond the surface, just taking the really obvious stuff that's there in terms of the wants and needs, then um, you're going to miss a trick. So um, I did a little search earlier just to show you what I mean by this. So um, I don't know why I've chosen the example tofu. <laughs> Bear with me. There's some interesting stuff here. So if I was working for like a grocery retailer or a food based business, I might be interested in tofu and how do people search around tofu. So um, this is an answer the public wheel. If you're not familiar with it, um, answer the public, obviously answer the public.com. You just pop your word in and it spins out all of these which are based on Google's search suggestions. Um, and 
uh, you may or may not know, but the, the darker the green dots, then the more popular that that search term is like kind of now. So it's topical trending stuff. So I'd look at this and I'm like, okay, tofu with, um, okay. So my content this week, I need to create a, a, a recipe that is tofu with black bean sauce. That's what people want. Okay. I'm going to create that. Um, I think a, a good place to start with that is well what other tofu with black bean sauces out there and i think that's where tools like buzzsumo have become really good because you can get a sense of what's out there already what works how do i make mine different you know i think again if you just scrape the surface and look at that it's like what are you going to create that stands out i mean you're not right you're just creating stuff um but my other my other point here is and i think one of the best things and one of the things i like to do with answer the public is is to look for like trends and behaviors and if i go back to the other bubbles there this sort of stuff is hidden in search behavior and online behavior more broadly like people's attitudes their thoughts their feelings who they trust and um, what they hope for they they tell google and they they you know they behave online it's, it's easy to observe and they tell you about themselves sense the sense of themselves so they'll tell you labels you know whether they think they're a bookworm that sort of stuff um some examples with this one i think if i jump down to the bottom uh right about here so we can see tofu jamie oliver right so um i mean I, as far as i know jamie oliver obviously a british chef doesn't sell tofu but he's probably got some tofu recipes and that's just someone saying tofu jamie oliver so to me that's someone thinking oh, i wonder what jamie oliver's take on tofu is uh so they probably trust him right so at that point again i i might be like jumping into a tool like Bustumo and thinking actually what is it that's like how has Jamie Oliver talked about tofu in the past? What, what learnings can I take from the content he's already created on tofu? Um, which works for me there. And uh, there's other things. So um, there was an interesting one I found earlier looking at this. So um, like here, tofu to chicken ratio. So again, like on, on the surface, I could see that and go, okay, I will create a piece of content that explains um, if you're gonna, uh, replace chicken or tofu or swap them out in a recipe what's the ratio that's probably a sensible thing to do but actually what's the step beyond that like do you look through your whole um, recipe collection online already and start like actually reassessing any chicken dishes and thinking well could that be swapped for tofu like what you know there's a behavior here right we, we can learn that people like to substitute tofu for chicken um, and how do we help them with that beyond just creating a piece of content that is about tofu to, to chicken ratio um, and other things, you know, like this branch is always really interesting to me. So can, can tofu, um, tofu, can you lose weight? So um, another thing that I often jump into is just Google suggestions, which is what um, answer the public scrapes. So um, can help you lose weight. So um, this is kind of wild card playing, which I like to do. So if you go back and put a space in here, we start to see all these other things. So you know, I started with that audience who were into tofu because that's what I'm doing. Great. But actually, if we know that weight loss is a, a priority for them or something that some of them are curious about, then what else can we look at? And do we want to create some of this other other content? Maybe you do, maybe you don't. But I think for me, if you can take that time to plan and look for trends and behaviours and create content that taps into that rather than just the really obvious stuff that people are telling you what they want, then then that's a really good place to start. Um, and I think the other point is to make sure that you're doing this like on a regular basis. So um, answer the public has some really cool features now where you can compare so i can compare tofu searches that i've run today versus this time last month and see what's new so that i'm seeing what's fresh and what's relevant um, and actually just a note that if we've got any pro users on the um webinar um answer public pro you now have access to um this feature so i think you can schedule up to two alerts so um for gyms and Pure Gym, who's a, a gym brand in the UK, I get e daily emails now that tell me any new suggestions that are coming up. So going back to that point, if you're stretched for time, you're under pressure to create lots of content and to prove ROI and to do it quickly, um, I guess insight landing in your inbox is, is what you want, right? Like you don't actually have to go out and dig for it. So um, yeah, planning, I think for me is, is the number one thing, because if you can anticipate what your audience wants, you can think differently to your competitors. Um, you can really get ahead of the pack doing that. Yeah, Sophie, and if, if I could just, um, uh, something that you were talking about there, especially in terms of tying, uh, it, tying people's wants and needs to the behaviors or how they tend to search. I think one thing that we look at at BuzzSumo a lot and we've done some research into is, is the language that people use when they're actually typing the search. And the verb that someone chooses to use will be quite instructive for A, where they're at in their, in their discovery process. Are they looking for um, just to gather information? Are they actually looking to make a purchase? Um, 
or and you know in your example of tofu you know somebody using words like um, want or cook or need or um, how do I you know, those kinds of we might think of them as filler words, but they're actually quite telling yeah. for exactly what is driving their search in the first place. Absolutely. I, we, I did, I've talked about it on a previous webinar, but um, I worked on a campaign previously for a skiing holiday brand. And uh, we started off looking at how people were searching around skiing and everything that came back was very, like you say, the words that were in there were, were very telling that it was people who perhaps didn't ski regularly. They were asking like, is skiing safe? Is it good for my knees? And it's the sort of stuff that you start to get a sense. Well, if you're a regular skier, you're probably not searching in that way. Um, and we shifted the word that we used to skiers. Um, because it's kind of like, you know, if you do it enough, you take on the thing, right? You don't go skiing anymore. You are a skier. And actually, um, that tapped into, a, there was such interesting searches that we started getting on, uh, from that. So it was like, are skiers better than snowboarders? Um, and we, we sort of tapped into this whole rivalry that we were able to create a load of content about and have real fun with actually. Um, but like you say, just the words that people were using kind of gave us an insight as to who they were and what, where they were kind of in their skiing journey. And it meant we could be much more tailored and relevant to them. Great, cool, thank you. Um, just a reminder to anyone that's sending in questions, please send them into the Q&A, thank you. Cool, so um, Eric, I guess for people in content marketing, this is kind of about understanding the difference between keyword research and audience research. What's your um, interpretation about those kind of different methods? Oh. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I really, I, I, I really like the way that um, that we've started to frame this conversation about um, whether we're digging into the behavior that our audience is is undertaking, or if we're talking about researching the audience itself. Um, there's something about keyword research that's that's quite literal. Uh, we can obviously um, track it over time and we can look back into how keyword search has evolved. Um, what are the trends? What are the terms that people are searching for month on month? Um, but there's always a little bit of a, there's a bit of a bias there because we're depending a little bit on the input that we initially start with. And we can dig a little deeper and we can then start to expand into the related terms, um, the, the searches that people are running maybe in tandem or side by side. But, um, but it's really, ultimately what we're, what we're trying to do is we're trying to solve problems for our audience. Whether somebody is searching for, taking Sophie's Tofu example, whether somebody's searching for um, recipes for tofu, or they're concerned about their diet, or they are hosting a dinner party. Um, ultimately, the, the searches that they're going to run might be similar to somebody else. But depending on who they are and what kind of, um, what kind of things they're interested in, what they're, where they're based, what their demographic is, um, that's, that's going to be unique to them. And so creating content for one audience versus another audience is going to be really different. And we can look at all different ways to slice that up. And one thing that we have done in BuzzSumo a lot over the years is use that kind of keyword research to determine where somebody's at, as I mentioned, in their, in their buyer's process. Is somebody not quite familiar with, an, with a, a category? They're just trying to gather information. You're going to see a lot of questions and keyword searches um, and uh, content that they end up clicking on that's quite explanatory. Guides, how-tos, um, answers to questions like what or um, who or why. Whereas somebody that is maybe further on in that process is probably looking for different kinds of answers. They're actually looking for, you know, potentially like a step-by-step -step, uh, way to accomplish something specific. So. Um, I'm just going to sort of steal right from uh, something that Sophie uh, and I were talking about the other day, you know, that audience research is, is more strategic. There's, when you're researching an audience, it's something that you're kind of always evolving. In marketing, we, we talk about that as maybe building personas or building key user groups that we're marketing to. 
But the idea of creating key personas that make up the, the large percentage of who we're building content for, that's something that we continue to iterate on. We create a base, it's full of some basic assumptions, we test those assumptions and we refine over time. Um, but it's always forward thinking. It's always trying to anticipate how do the needs of our audience change. Um, but that's our core audience. And so we need to try to move with them. What our audience might experience though at one moment in time is gonna be different today versus what they might experience next month. Uh, one of the examples we look at a lot is um, somebody that is in the DIY space, um, maybe somebody that's trying to get into home improvement. And if they are working on a home and something breaks and it's an emergency, the type of keyword searches that they're looking for are quick answers or quick solutions that can help them solve an immediate problem. But if they're looking for help over a longer period of time, a bigger project that they're undertaking, that's going to change the way they search and it's also going to change the type of content that we build. Um, so it's really this balance between creating content that is tactical, maybe a little shorter form, maybe more directly answering the question that somebody might be asking, and strategic. How do we create content that, that almost turns us as creators into um, virtual consultants for our audience, that we can work alongside them to solve their problems and build that level of trust over a longer period of time. I think one other thing I'd add to that is just, um, to me, keyword research, the the way you prioritize, right, is like what's what's got the highest volume? Like we want to create content that captures the most people. Whereas audience research, you're focused on, like like Eric said, you've got the personas that you know are right for your business and actually the way you're trying to prioritize is what content is right for those people. Um, not necessarily like what is the thing that will cover the most people, it's what will cover the right people, which I think is a, a subtle difference, but it's really important for me. Yeah, there's this there's this conversation we have a lot too when we're building content, which is exactly that. Do you take a kind of uh, broad approach or do you get quite targeted? Do you create kind of mini verticals within your broad audience space? Um, and, or do you kind of create these big guides? You know, an example is, do I build, you know, BuzzSumo's audience is a lot of content marketers and agencies. So we're almost, you know, writing about, it's very meta. We're writing about <laughs> how to write about content. <laughs> Um, but, you know, knowing that our, one of our key audience groups is marketers and, and marketing agencies or content specialists, you know, there's the big thing that's a, a, the kind of the 101, your introduction to content marketing, why it matters, why it's important, what are some basic best practices. That's great. That can maybe be a, a type of tent pole content. Um, but on a, on a month on month or quarter on quarter basis, what are the individual challenges and problems we're solving? Can we meet our audience where they're at, at the point that they're at? The, the value of a tentpole piece of content is ideally that it's evergreen, that it, that it can live for a longer period of time, that, that a guide to good content marketing best practices is relevant today and relevant next month and maybe doesn't need to be updated you know, until, until you know, big industry shifts happen. But somebody today might be looking for an answer like, why are my, why are my ad rankings getting depressed? Or, or why is my organic reach on, on my Facebook content going down? Or, um, hey, I've noticed my search ranking dropping. Why is that happening? Th those are kind of very tactical questions that dig into something that's happening to them right now. Um, and they're probably getting pressure from somebody else in their organization looking for an answer to that. And so we want to be able to produce content that, you know, satisfies that immediate need. And, and to your point, Sophie, that, that's not going to have application to everybody. But, but there's value in creating um, content that really sticks with a core group because ultimately we want everybody to see us as trusted advisors. But to get there, we need to be able to solve specific challenges. And, and getting back to that that problem with volume and breaking through the noise, there's a lot of how to do content marketing guides out there. 
Um, so why is one better than another? You might prefer one, you might prefer the source, um, but it's all of the tactical stuff that people start to dig into. Um, I noticed somebody in the chat just I was watching you know, talking about, you know, how do, how do we apply this, um, you know, uh, how do we roll this out? And that's the kind of thing that as a content creator, that keeps somebody on your site. You maybe bring them in with a big piece of content, but it's how do you keep them there and continue to answer their questions while they're there? Um, it might solve a small segment audience you know, problem, but once you capture that audience and you understand what their challenges are, then you can try to replicate that for different sub-segments of your audience as you go. Cool, okay, great. Thanks, Sophie. Uh, thanks, Sophie. Thanks, Eric. Um, question for Sophie next. So how can Audience Insight um, help to figure out where people are in terms of their um, purchase journey and how can kind of content be shaped to where they're at and I guess this one's actually for Eric as well so yeah perhaps you can start us off with that one Sophie. Yeah so so like some of what Eric said earlier really touched on this for me which is is that idea of people give you clues in the way they search right in terms of where they are in a journey um, based on the words that they use um, and you know I'm always very aware we saw when we did the intro for this we've got people from all around the world on this webinar and uh, I'm sure there will be people in agencies people who are sort of one-man bands sort of figuring this all out by themselves so customer journey obviously varies massively depending on what industry you're in and, and what sort of team you're working in um, I tend to use this just as a really really basic kind of um, awareness to advocacy slightly modified um, version that uh, I like to prompt people to think about and actually um, if you go on searchlistening.com and look in our academy, there's like a worksheet that you can purchase. I think it's like $10 um, that gives you some questions to explore um, so that you can start researching your audience at each stage across this. But for me, um, there's some interesting questions that you can start thinking about and, and your answer to these might be in search behavior. It might be in more broad online behavior. So what sites are they visiting or how are they talking on social media? Um, but triggers, start thinking about what's going on in your audience's life that gets them in the purchase mindset. And I know, again, we might not have, um, it might not be um, a solely sort of B2C audience that we've got today, but you know, that works for B2B as well, right? Like whether it's purchase or conversion or engagement, whatever the kind of goal is, what gets the audience in that mindset? Um, and then awareness, how might your audience become aware of a brand like yours? So for me, there's a really, um, I don't know how many people use Answer the Public to look at their brand, but it's really, really important. And if, when I've mentioned this previously, we've had people say, oh, well, my brand's not big enough. We don't get many people searching for me. That's fine. But like category works there. Um, and also if there are some brands that are kind of the big hitters, then you might want to look at how people search around them, that sort of thing. And you'll learn things there. Um, the consideration is, again, Eric said this earlier, but start getting down into that, like what information are they really looking to find out about your category, your product, your business, whatever it is. Um, and there'll be, you know, questions is quite a deliberate word in that prompt in that I think that's the point where people do start asking lots and lots of questions. The why is, what is, who is, um, how do I, whatever it is. Um, conversion, there's lots of interesting stuff there looking around um, you know sales discounts coupons and those are the sorts of words again you can plug those into answer the public and start to spin out what sort of things that you're looking for i'm always amazed um no matter what i put in so um i think i was looking at gym memberships in answer the public recently and uh something that i wasn't aware of was just the different sort of facets of um discount type that people are looking for so um i always expect student discounts having been a student myself i know that you know <laughs> you will get everything uh, discounted as much as you can at that point in your life but you know rightly so absolutely but currently in the climate in the uk lots of people for looking looking for nhs discounts for things military discounts um sort of veteran discounts old person discounts and these are all things that i just hadn't quite anticipated in that gym space but through looking at, at search uh, behavior search listening in answer to the public you start to see people telling you the labels that they're giving themselves that they believe means that they should be given some sort of discount um which is really, really interesting. And then the final point on this for me, um, which is really important is don't forget about post purchase stuff. So you've, you've done all this work to get someone to buy something from you, to engage with you, to, to read your content, whatever it is, 
the, the goal that you've been working to, it's really important to figure them out and, and be there to help them and meet their needs in the lead up to that, that conversion point. But don't forget to nurture that relationship that you've got with them after they've purchased or engaged or whatever it is. And there's some really interesting stuff behaviorally um, and language based for me um, in this space. So I, I sort of think about if you're in a sort of B2C world, then pre-purchase to post-purchase. If not, B2B or not for profit, whatever it is you might be working in. It, same thing works if you think about abstract versus possessive. So um, I will just jump back into Answer the Public to show you some examples here. So um, again, very random examples that I've picked, but uh, if we look at like a b2c world lipstick so i've popped lipstick into answer the public um getting all sorts of things like you know let's look here uh, where lipstick's made where's the lipstick emoji um when was it invented when will it expire so those sorts of things already you can start to get a sense of okay this is someone just researching stuff possibly not even in that purchase funnel like it's a curiosity thing i often see things that um i come to realize are actually like crossword clues which is always a, a red herring that throws me off so lipstick will throw up a certain amount of stuff but always think about looking at like my lipstick as well because here we start to see so i've scrolled all the way down to the bottom of the answer the public page here but my lipstick always bleeds it always comes off it always looks messy it always feathers so you might have, you know, if you're a beauty retailer, you might have converted the person at that point. They've bought the lipstick from you, but you can continue to engage with them and, and answer their problems here um, because they're literally telling Google. And actually, these are these are all problems that you can um, help people with. Um, and just the other example that I had for that was, um, again, if you're not in the B2C world, it works with other things. So this is an example of more kind of abstract to um, uh, what was I called it possessive. So mental health. Um, you can see like really, really interesting stuff here. So mental health for children, for kids, for men, for teens, all sorts of things um, down here. Mental health is important. It's not an excuse. Um, it's as important as physical health. It's nothing to be ashamed of. So, so really interesting searches there. But actually, if we look at my mental health, um, the branch that I always like to look at for this kind of search is the is. Uh, and you've got people here, my mental health is bad. My mental health is suffering. My mental health is deter deteriorating. It's not good, et cetera, et cetera what fascinates me here is that you think about search behavior and again coming from its kind of traditional seo world it's always been so commercial but this is people literally typing into the google box or voicing to google if they're using voice search they're telling google that their mental health is bad so um i think my point here is you know don't disregard search behavior as something that can only be used in that b2c really kind of commercial purchase journey sense actually people have conversations um, with Google and tell it, you know, things that they might not tell the most important trusted people in their life because it's kind of that an anonymity. Um, and so, yeah, for me, I, I think a tip I always like to give people if they're looking to explore kind of the idea of search listening is play with that um, abstract versus possessive. Always have a look at my and think about the po post purchase or people, you know, bringing it to themselves. And I go back to the example that, that I spoke to Eric about a second ago with the skiing versus skiers it's just some simple tweaks with with the words that you're exploring with online research can tell you it can open up sort of a whole new world of stuff that you just weren't anticipating yeah um th yeah there's so much good stuff in there sophie i the thing that jumped out at me was was this idea of inviting your audience into your content marketing process Oftentimes, I think when, when, when we're doing research, we're so, we're so um, I think, flooded these days with, with the amount of data that we can collect. And it's amazing. I mean, there are two, three people on the call today, uh, panelists that uh, all work for data companies in some way or another. So, you know, uh, data is amazing. Use data. That's, that's <laughs> a big mission. Uh, but what I would also encourage everybody to, to remember is that to, to really understand your audience, sometimes you just need to ask. One thing that we've employed a lot with, with our content at BuzzSumo over the years is, is creating advocacy within our audience before we even publish something. So we'll identify some of our key personas, our user groups, and rather than create content that we think that they're searching for, even that we've, we know that they're interested in, we'll do a round of solicitation in advance of creating that content. And we'll ask of our community through social, through um, our, our newsletter, through our marketing lists, uh, what is their biggest challenge right now? What is the question they're trying to answer? 
what is the problem their business is trying to solve using social data or using uh, content, whatever it is. And you would be amazed how many people want to share that because <laughs> could see here on the call, I mean, we're all facing a ton of challenges every day. And, and the big kind of um, edicts or best practices, they only go so far. I mean, we need to get really tactical about how does this apply in e-commerce? How does this apply in, in the healthcare field, in entertainment, in fashion, whatever industry you work in? Well, oftentimes the best people to tell us that are the people we're actually trying to write for. Uh, you would be amazed at how many people are willing to so give you that that advice or that feedback about what they're looking for answers to. Use that as prompts to create your content because you're already then building stakeholders in it before you've even published it. And you create this promotional uh, launch pad for your content once it goes out the door. I mean, we all know that creating good content is, is certainly about you know, building content that has value, but it's also about building the promotional structure to help it grow once it gets out the door to get over that kind of, you know, saturation uh, challenge that we're all facing. Um, so I would, I would definitely encourage anybody that, that has either existing customers or you've got a decent uh, lead funnel right now, just start asking your customers what types of content they would like to see, what answers are they looking for, and then use that to build your content. Even invite them into the draft process. Say, hey, this is going live tomorrow, but I wanted to get you a sneak peek about it. I mean, how many of us don't love, you know, the idea of getting advanced notice of something before anybody else? What that also does is the moment you send something live, you've already got a list of people wanting to share it. They want to be the first to share a new bit of research or a new answer, a new recipe, a new guide, um, because that helps them increase their own level of authority in their personal, you know, their personal system. So um, I would definitely say that that part of this audience piece as well is is just bringing them more into the process as you're building content. Yeah, absolutely agree with that. Oh, cool. great. Thanks, guys. Um, so we've kind of touched on this already, but I'm sure people would love um, to just kind of have a rundown of where else we should be looking for audience insight apart from, obviously, Google. Yeah, um, Sophie, I can I can give my two cents on this. Yeah. Uh, so this uh, this gets really into the content sources, um, finding sources where people are going for information. Um, so we need to broaden our net. Obviously, um, search behavior, super important. You should definitely be using um, whatever keyword tool you're using. I mean, BuzzSumo's got a great keyword planner. Love Answer the Public. Um, so first and foremost, obviously, we want to understand search behavior and search volumes and the types of keywords people are looking for. Beyond that, forums themselves, understanding what questions people are asking in places like Quora or Reddit. A lot of people think of Reddit as a conversational platform or a social platform, but it's a, it's a question and answer platform too. Big long threads evolve out of people asking questions about products or services or best methods, et cetera. So um, Reddit and Quora and other Q&A sites are really, really good. If you work in e-commerce, you should definitely be digging into the Q&A forums of um, products that are similar to the products that you sell or the actual products that you sell. Um, I would be looking at uh, I would be looking at Facebook pages data as well. Remember that brands are often creating content native on, on Facebook. Uh, if you know of leading brands within your space, uh, either that are competing with you or that you partner with, check out the type of content they're producing on their Facebook page. Uh, if you're using BuzzSumo, we have a Facebook analysis tool that gives you the post level insight into the content that they're creating. Uh, you can see what types of content they're creating from videos to um, coupons and giveaways, when they go live, et cetera. Uh, I would definitely dig into that. Um, beyond that, I would also be looking at YouTube, whether it's YouTube search behavior or YouTube content. U YouTube video right now, um, it's an amazing place for you to uh, really, either as a content creator, get down to your audience's level, or even... You know, if you're looking for answers, YouTube is a great place to find good answers to your own questions. Um, 
again, in BuzzSumo, we have a really great YouTube analysis feature that can give you some insights into what types of videos drive engagement. We can break them down by category. We can look at the titles, how the titles evolve and what titles drive engagement. So if you're building content on YouTube, um, but just remember that if always ask yourself, you know, is, is this a place where I think my audience lives? If, you, if the answer is, or if you hesitate before you say no, if you're thinking maybe or yes, then you should be on that platform and looking. Pinterest, Reddit, Facebook. Uh, and these are mostly, let's be honest, uh, some of the ones we're mentioning here are, are a little bit uh, Western or English language centric. I mean, there is an entire other category of sites, um, whether they're social sites or, or blogs or, or news dailies, um, in different parts of the world that you should also be looking at that might be more relevant to your local market. Cool, thank you. Okay, um, Sophie, I, yeah, have you got anything to add to that one? No, well, I think that was a really, really comprehensive uh, <laughs> rundown of all, all of the, all the sources that you can be using. But I think, yeah, it's, it, you know, it's, it's such an interesting point that Eric made earlier that I think, particularly looking at like online data that we can observe, there's so much out there, right? And, and, I think the majority of myself included um, marketers perhaps are only scraping the surface in terms of, of where they're looking. Cool. Okay, great. Thanks guys. Um, so uh, I've noticed actually a few questions coming in from um, some of the attendees today about kind of measurement and how you can kind of prove the ROI of your content. So um, I guess, yeah, that'd be a quick question for Eric. Like how do people um, sort of measure the impact that their work is having? How would you go about doing that? Yeah, great question. Um, so I think, you know, obviously we're all driving towards purchase behavior. Whatever your measure of purchase is for BuzzSumo, that's obviously, we're a, a, a software platform. So for us, we are always driving to, did somebody actually sign up to the tool, take out a subscription? So you know, that kind of subscription conversion is maybe the the, the holy grail or the, the end game in terms of proving out ROI. But before that, you know, looking at the entire funnel, we generally tend to, for us, tend to break down our content into two categories. Um, one would be the type of content that would drive traffic to our site. And the other would be the type of content that drives engagement, uh, engagement on social or link data, et cetera. So uh, if you're building content that's meant to be a traffic driver, to push people towards your page to learn more about your company or the products, then you should definitely be looking at that, those referral traffic um, statistics within your, whatever analytics platform you're using for your website. You want to see whether the content that you're producing is actually acting as a gateway to push people onto your platform. But then of course, you probably also want to be looking at the behavior on site once they get there. One of the things we definitely don't want to see is a bunch of people that piece of content say working in terms of driving traffic to our site, but then we don't want to see high bounce rates. We don't want to see people coming to the site, having a quick look and immediately leaving. So you might want to look at the time they spend on site. You might want to create some sort of understanding of how many pages they visit, how long they stay on our site once we get them there. That that would probably all fall again and sort of if we're building content to drive traffic and then from an engagement perspective an engagement really breaks down into social engagement and link data if you're building content to increase your your authority your search rankings your visibility i mean you definitely want to be building content that is uh that's driving towards stronger link profiles um Using BuzzSumo, for example, you can look at content within any topical category and sort the data by what drives the most links. And then you could create an analysis report on what the best content that drives links, what, what those pieces tend to have in common. Are they a particular length? Um, were they published on a particular day? Uh, so I would definitely recommend kind of using historical data to see what drives links. If you're trying to say, jump on current trends, um, be fast to market with content, whether that's reactive content or something, you may be looking at more social data. Uh, so look at whether the, your, your engagement data for your articles is, is ticking up. Can you drive up the engagement that your articles get when, um, when you post them? Do they get shared heavily? I know, I know that the, you know, the one thing that, um, 
the big conversation we always get in is is what what's a vanity metric versus what isn't and and i totally get that i mean i'm not suggesting that any of us creating content should just kind of stare at our facebook likes and then report on that as a successful piece of content obviously we need to build out what the what that engagement leads to down the line ultimately driving towards you know whatever that purchase um, goal is but um using engagement data as a an a window or a door into um, whether we're building content that is getting some traction, maybe a good jumping off point. Um, Sophia, I don't, I don't know if that's something that you all look at when you're building content too, it's kind of, you know, it's one part of the, of the, the game here, not the whole thing. Yeah. And, and um, yes, I think it's, it's, I mean, the question that, that we started this part with is, is so broad, right? Like, uh, I guess it comes, I, you know, it's a very, um, very much a strategist's uh, default answer, I think, but it's kind of like, what are, you, what are you trying to achieve? And actually, therefore, then it comes back to what's specific to you because, um, yeah, there's, there's so many different ways that you can measure, right? Awesome. Cool. Okay. Thanks guys. We're going to go to um, questions now um, from the floor. We've got, well, we've got about 10 minutes, but we're going to try and get through as many as we can because we've had some really good questions come through. So um, we'll, go, we'll go speed round. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, the first one um, is for Eric, but actually I'd last, like to ask this to um, Sophie as well. So, this one specifically for Eric is, can you recommend a long read book that dives into the difference between the long-term strategic content and shorter term content? Um, what's a good way to learn about these different types of content? I'm in B2B marketing, um, this person says. But Sophie, I guess the question to you would be, um, yeah, what recommended, what books can you recommend to people that can sort of get them um, a better understanding of how to apply sort of search listening method to content? So yeah. To Eric first, though. Oh boy, <laughs> uh, books that I love. Um, so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna uh, do, say anything kind of revolutionary here. Uh, this is probably some books that some of you um, have on your shelves already or have read. But one of my favorite um, B2B marketing books um, specifically is um, it's a book by Dale Carnegie um, called How to Win Friends and Influence People. Uh, I, I, it's I would say over the years, it's probably the book I go back to again and again because sort of the fundamental principles, particularly about, about building relationships with your audience or with your internal team. It's just uh, some of those fundamentals I still rely on to this day. Um, there's another good one by, um, I'm forgetting the author's name. It's called The 10X Rule. I can't remember who the author is. I will look it up for you. But the, just look up The 10X Rule. That's her. Um, there's, a, there's a really good, some really good insights there into um, how you build kind of content that stands out um, from a lot of the other content being you know, created in your space. Um, yeah, I would say those are kind of the two that, that first jumped to top of mind that I, that I tend to uh, revisit again and again. I would add to that two books which are less, um, I suppose, less give you the nitty gritty of, of content planning, but more speak to um, observe, observing online behavior and um, learning about your audience in terms of that. So one is Contagious by Jonah Berger, um, and he has a really nice useful framework in that for you to start thinking about um, what would motivate an audience to, to engage with your content and what sort of things you might explore. Um, it's the STEPS framework, so S-T-E-P-P-S. Um, and I think you can start to use that as a bit of a framework for planning your audience research. Uh, and then the other book, which I absolutely love um, and uh, spent a whole work day reading it, even though it touches on some very um, not suitable for work topics, but in the best possible way, uh, is a book called Everybody Lies by um, Seth Stevens Davidovitz. Um, and Seth Stevens Davidovitz, it's a mouthful, is um, he, he, so he wrote his university thesis, I believe, on, um, he basically tried to predict the US elections um, at one given year based on how people were searching and his, um, his predictions were more accurate than all the polls that were going on at the time. Um, and his book looks at search behavior, but lots of other different online behavior. And um, it really hammers home the point that, you know, you can do surveys, you can do research um, with audiences and they will tell you one thing, but often 
observing their online behavior will tell you their true thoughts and their true motivations. Perfect, thank you. Cool, okay, so um, someone's asking here, we may have answered this already, but um, we can touch on it again if we haven't. Um, do you find yourselves also using Google Trends data for deeper dives into search intent, especially kind of tracking changes over time? Yeah, I definitely, definitely make use of, of um, Google Trends. I think it's good if you if you've observed some interesting stuff and then you can actually start to understand the context around it via Google Trends, looking at kind of seasonality or what sort of things might have prompted that search to spike. The, the other thing in Google Trends that's really nice is that it starts to give you kind of related topics and, and searches. So um, if you've got a starting point, that can be a nice way to jump off into, okay, if I know my audience are interested in this thing, actually what else matters to them? Yeah, I'm going to sort of shamelessly promote BuzzSumo here. I think that uh, we, I definitely use Google Trends. The one thing that I would say, though, is um, going from that macro to more targeted view. Um, one of the things we do in BuzzSumo is we kind of break down trends into you know, audience trends versus, say, competitor content trends. Um, so, for example, our topics tool could is essentially like a like a trending look at what other content creators are building content around what terms are they leveraging so I, I find that really useful because that gives you a real kind of insight into how other content creators are thinking about building content and what they're focusing on which feels to me a little bit more actionable than just kind of broader trends looking um, the other thing too is um, I do think I think I saw somebody in the chat kind of mention something about uh, you know, keywords is more than just kind of the now or the literal. Um, and I, to that point, I think there's there's some truth in that. I would say looking back at trend data related to monthly search volume is really, really helpful. Just kind of look at, is the volume of search on a particular term, is that growing over time? Is it flat? Is it decreasing? That can give you some insight into whether, whether an audience has kind of moved on from a particular a term or a phrase or and kind of is expressing themselves differently um so i i yeah i love google trends um but i have been kind of looking for more more tactical ways to kind of get closer to to what our audience is after lately cool okay um so we get some kind of similar questions to this regularly on our webinars um but i think this would be an interesting one um for you eric as well so can you kind of suggest how audience research might be done for kind of small and local businesses? Um, so that was one question and separately someone was asking about kind of not, not for profits, um, churches, organizations like that. Is it, do the same rules apply? Uh, I mean, I think so. In some ways, I think for local businesses, one of the things that you might have access to is, I mean, Pandemics aside, you might have better access to, to who actually is your customer in your local market. Um, one of the things that we used to do, um, going back to grad school days, but when thinking about starting a business as an entrepreneur, you know, you, you kind of want to try to get talking to as many customers as you can to understand what do they think of your service? How much would they pay for it? What do they value? What do they not value? That becomes your first persona that first person who purchases from you becomes a persona that you can use to spin out what do other people within that persona group look like. So however you can get talking to your customer, whether, you know, in some ways, when you're, when you're, um, a lot of your customer base is anonymized because they come through, say, a, you know, a software funnel and, and we put all this technology in front of them and they convert and then we look at all the, the sort of digital footprints that they've left behind. Um, that in some ways we, we have to kind of uh, put a narrative on top of that. But if you work in a local business, you maybe don't have to create that narrative and then test the assumptions of your narrative. You might actually get the narrative directly from your local customers. So I would say it's still valuable to use your local customers to build out your personas and then use your personas as templates for other people within that market. And I would say the same thing for nonprofits. You might not think of personas as people you sell to. You might think of them as people that donate. You might call them something different in a nonprofit versus um, a for-profit business. But essentially, we're still trying to create audience persona groups 
based on what do they want, what are their key needs, what are their key pain points and challenges, what are the reasons why they might not choose to work with us, such that we can combat and answer those and assuage them of, of those uh, concerns that they might have, and what are the key things that they're looking for um, within a solution or a product or a service that you can kind of tout and answer um, to, again, kind of make them more likely to convert or donate to your business. And, and I would just add to that, I think I touched on it earlier, but I know earlier I talked about pre-purchase and post-purchase and looking at the differences there. I think I also used um, sort of abstract versus possessive. So, you know, for churches, my religion, my faith might be interesting things to explore. Um, I think just because people aren't buying things from you, there's, there's still a tangible thing almost to them, whether it's my finances, my faith, my health, um, my well-being, whatever it is. Um, and similarly for, for B2B, I think that sometimes the best B2B marketing is the B2B marketing that, that recognizes that as much as you're targeting business people um, and sort of, you know, the, the budget holders in any given business, actually those, those business people are still consumers in some way. Right. And, and you can appeal to them on that very human level. They will still have problems in the working world that, that, that they need help solving. And actually um, you can use the same sort of research methods. People don't, if I come back to using search behavior, people don't only search in their personal life, right? People search, you know, it might be that your, your printer has jammed in the office or something, but people will search for anything to do with, to do with work problems as well as personal problems. So um, try and anticipate what is going on in their world um, and start looking at how they might search around that and then identify those pain points that you can help them with. It's the same process and yeah as business people, we're all business people, right? We're here as, as marketers and content producers and we're, we're still human beings. Cool, okay, thanks. We're almost at time, but I'm just gonna ask one more question, which is actually two of them kind of wrapped into one. Um, so someone's asked, uh, for searches on Answer the Public, should we just ignore the kind of lower popularity searches in the content planning process? Um, and someone else has asked, um, how do you eliminate the pollution around the topic when it comes to planning content? I know we touched on some of this um, earlier in the webinar, but yeah, those feels like kind of they. I would those ones. I would say don't ignore the the kind of less popular stuff on answer the public. I I would I would say don't ignore less popular stuff. Full stop. No matter whether you're doing focus group surveys, um, observing some sort of other online behaviour, because. It's, it's what we talked about right at the beginning, right, in terms of keyword research versus audience research. It might be that something is super important to a small subset of your audience. And if you just answered that one question for them, you would have them, them hooked and they would be, you know, the most valuable customers for the duration that you're in business. Um, equally, I rec you know, the reason that those dots exist on Answer the Public is because we, I know the team so often get asked uh, what's the volume behind these searches and how do we prioritize? I, prioritization for me is a really interesting point. And, and again, slight cop out strategist answer is that the way you prioritize should be based on what you're trying to achieve. And if you're trying to really, really deeply connect with an audience, then it may be that some of their searches and their, their pain points that they're telling you about seem less popular, but they're really important to that audience. So um, it's about, I guess combining lots and lots of different data sources so that you can actually get a sense of what really does matter because something might seem not popular in search. Um, but to Eric's point just now, if it was a local business that you're talking to and you saw something in search and you thought, well, okay, answer the public says that that's a search term that people are searching, but it's not that popular. And you tested that with your, your local audience that you had that kind of direct route with. And they said, to you, oh no, no, that's really, really important to us. Then, you know, if you just disregarded it, you would have, you would have, lost that opportunity to help them i suppose yeah i that's so well so well said um and i would say the two things that came to mind really quickly about the volume game is that one of the things at buzz sumo that we always do is we always look at things in context against other things right I mean, when you're thinking about what's a good search volume well on the one hand i might search for articles about keto so i'm going to keep it in the food space like i might search <laughs> articles about keto and I might see tons of engagements um, but and then I might balance that against searches for vegan right now if I'm in the food space and I'm going to create content about diets and trying to gain some traction I could chase keto but what if I learned that while maybe vegan has less overall engagement 
What if on a per article basis engagement is better or links are better? Or what if the content volume is lower, which means it might be easier to stand out because it's less competitive. So just because, you know, the big scary number at the top is maybe lower than what we would might expect doesn't mean that it's worth, um, it, we should ignore it. And, and about topic pollution, you know, I, I just think that this comes down to the narrative that you tell within your story. Um, within BuzzSumo, for example, we might analyze the entire data set about articles that are written about a big topic like data science or, or fashion trends or something. Um, and we might get like kind of a template for what tends to work. But what's going to make it stand out is, again, pairing it with what Sophie said about specifying this particular challenge that your audience has, that becomes your narrative, that becomes your point of view. And, and so you can both use kind of the, the research you do using keywords and search and the research that you might do in kind of content formats and styles to create kind of this unique point in the middle that represents your brand, it represents your voice, um, and ideally kind of presents a new spin on something that, yes, while maybe somebody's created something similar before, they haven't created it in the way that you've just done it. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, someone just asked what the relationship is between us, all of us guys. Um, and I just resp responded to them to say, we've all got kind of mutual interest in content. I, I personally have used um, BuzzSumo a lot in my time when I was working at agencies before I joined Answer the Public. So I'm a big fan of the tool. We're also, all of our businesses are founded in Brighton. I know, Eric, that you're in Boston, but we're all Brighton born and bred. So we've got that in common too. <laughs> so yeah. Um, cool. Uh, I think, yeah, I think it's just a great example of, you know, uh, a bunch of passionate people all within the space uh, that somehow found each other in, in Brighton <laughs> and started uh, kind of thinking of ways they could share knowledge. Exactly. Cool. Okay. I think that's all we've got time for. We've gone a little bit over. Um, I just wanted to say a massive thank you to you guys. It's been really, really brilliant and informative. We've had lots of people saying how much they've enjoyed um, today's session on the chat and everything. So that's cool. Um, a few people were um, asking if there's going to be recording. So we've mentioned it will be uploaded to the YouTube channel um, and you will get um, a recording as well in the follow up notes because you've all registered. Also, we may do a transcript of the session this time because I know there's um, people that perhaps don't understand all of our accents. Yeah, apologies. I saw some notes about how fast I speak. It's because uh, I'm really passionate about it and I feel like I have a lot that I want to say and squeeze into a short amount of time. So apologies. It's <laughs> all good. So yeah, I think we will start doing transcripts to help anyone that might not be English speaking as well um, to make sure everyone gets the most out of the session. And as I mentioned, there's the, the playback as well. Um, people are asking about the books. We'll include those in the notes so that you can get those too. Um, I think that's pretty much everything um, for the time being, in case you guys have got anything else that you wanted to add. No, just thanks so much for coming on, Eric. It was really, really good and uh, interesting. I always, yeah, just being able to chat about this stuff that I, you know, it fascinates me and it's nice to find a, a like mind. <laughs> Yeah, likewise. I, uh, I've i had such a great time over the past couple of weeks just learning more from you and, and Hannah about your approaches to things. It's given me a lot of great ideas and I'm going to go nerd out for the rest of the week <laughs> on some things that I learned on this session too. So thank you very much. Cool. Um, just a final note, we do do these webinars every month. So um, they're on the last Wednesday of the month, which so the next one will be July the 29th. Um, we'll be sharing details of that one soon, so please do um, sign up. We'd love to have you back on the next webinar. Um, that's it. That's all we've got time for. Thank you once again, guys. It's been brilliant having you, and thanks to everyone that's joined for all of your questions. We'll see you next month. Thank you. Bye. Cheers. Bye. Thank you.